and that's uh, there's a couple, well, lots of very, very interesting ideas um, occurring to me, certainly, from, from uh, Norman's discussion there. Um, two um, key uh, announcements there. Uh, first of all, alternatives to travel. Um, how does that work? Um, it's going to be different for everybody. It could be car sharing, could be flexible working, could be promotion, promoting public transport, could be cutting flights, um, and also anywhere working, which uh, is a chance for businesses to explain to other businesses uh, how they're making flexible working work for them. So we're now, for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, we're going to uh, have a Q&A with Norman, where Norman will be available to take questions from the floor, um, and also um, uh, we can open the floor to uh, comments, hopefully, from people who have opinions on maybe how their business is, uh, is imp implementing some of these ideas uh, to leave a smarter legacy. And clearly, there are big savings to be made here. Evershed's cutting 1.3 million from its travel budget just by adopting uh, alternatives to, to travel and cutting its travel. Okay, so um, uh, I should ask first of all, that, has anybody got a question they'd like to ask Norman regarding uh, these uh, policies? You, sir, over there on the, on the left. Could you uh, just say um, your name and the company you're from before you ask your question? Keith Warburton from VC Insight. Um, the Department for Justice reportedly spends £42 million on prisoner transport some of which going by taxi. What plans do you have to recommend the installation of video conferencing in all prisons, remand facilities, and the courts? Uh, well, the Ministry of Justice is doing some, it's not my department, as you'll appreciate, but it is doing some work on, um, on remote evidence uh, provision in, in court systems. So it has, has signed up to the concept of, uh, of joining other departments and looking to minimise travel. It does so because, um, I don't pretend it's, uh, driven by environmental uh, agenda, but it does so because there is a, an operational benefit uh, in doing so. Um, the issue of prisoner travel um, is, is, uh, is not my particular baby, but I guess there is an issue about whether or not, uh, to what extent a prisoner has to be in a particular location at a particular time. But I agree with you that generally that the, uh, the opportunity to reduce travel um, in, in government departments, such as the Ministry of Justice, is significant, and I'll take that particular suggestion back to the MOJ. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, anybody else have a question that I'd like to uh, put to Norman? Okay, uh, well, okay, I've got a question here that uh, I'd like to uh, chip in in then. Uh, you um, touched there on, on the Department of Justice, Norman, but I'd be interested to know how the government itself has been uh, using technology to benefit uh, and uh, from alternatives to travel, if you have any thoughts on, on its wider use in government. We've certainly been doing, well, some of it's quite low-tech these days, but um, there's a great deal of, uh, of phone conferencing goes on. We don't have to be in the same room at the same time. Uh, we've got video conferencing facilities now in, in uh, I think, every department, and we use those. Um, I regularly give uh, remote speeches, um, rather than having to take a train or, or, or anything to the north of England, to give a, a speech to some collection of whatever it happens to be within my portfolio, um, I'll regularly record a speech now and send it up. And actually, that's perfectly acceptable to people, it seems, when they receive a, a speech in that way. And it means we don't have to travel up in large numbers, not just me, but uh, the civil service entourage. It feels it has to be with me on every occasion. Uh, also needn't travel up. So we can save money that way and save me time. And, and you know, quite frankly, you know, my, my day job, and I guess the job of many people in this room, is such that if you take half a day or, or three quarters per day travelling somewhere to give a half an hour speech, that's not a good use of time. And OK, you can do work on the train, but actually how much better it is to go into a video recording studio, which you have got in the Department for Transport, record a 20-minute speech, send it off remotely, and then get on with your work. Um, and that just seems to me to be a complete no-brainer. So there's quite a lot of that going on. We've also set a target in government for uh, reducing the number of flights, and uh, we were, we've got a 20% reduction in flights as, a, as an objective. That's partly about transferring to train, but it's also about saying, do we actually have to go somewhere? Do we have to go to this particular meeting, or can we deal with it in a different way? And you know, quite sometimes there's a need for a personal contact, but most times there isn't a necessity for that, and you can deal with matters in a different way. I mentioned the Department for Transport's um, uh, trial last um, autumn. Uh, last August, when we, we, we had a, a week when we encouraged people not to come in, as it were, and to work remotely. And actually, that worked perfectly all right. I mean, we got a uh, large number of people working either from home or from uh, outposts. We got outposts in Hastings, for example. 
uh, or indeed working from other government departments around the country, uh, working from remote hubs, and the idea that I think particularly attractive to me that you have in, in, in kind of small towns, you can have a, somebody running a, 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 a hub which is shared by a number of different uh, uh, businesses who can come in and use facilities there to connect up with London and so on. Seems to me to be entirely sensible. But there's a long way to go. Uh, you know, I, I did, when I did um, a radio programme on, uh, on, on this area uh, with uh, the BBC uh, um, last year, I, I don't know if the BBC is here or not, they said they might come along. Um, they, they, um, they said, well, we're interested in this. And so the reporter came um, down the line to me and to interview me. And I said, by the way, where are you? She said, uh, I'm, in, I'm in London, I'm in Bush House. And I said, well, where, where do you live? She said, Bristol. And I said, why have you come from Bristol to London to interview me remotely by radio? She said, because my producer told me I had to do that. So, you know, there's, there's, there's waste of money and, and waste of time right across. And uh, I just think if we can eliminate some of that and we persuade people to actually think about their time as, as, a, as, a, as a cost uh, and to think, do, do I want to spend money travelling uh, or can I actually eliminate that and do something else? Once we start getting that mindset in, then I think we start making some progress. And actually, quite a lot of journeys which are made don't have to be made. And that's the bottom line. That's yeah, very interesting, Norman. And I think um, I could just add to that. And I know for a fact some of my colleagues at the BBC do have, um, especially the ones who have to go on the radio early in the morning, uh, do have to, uh, uh, they have um, radio facilities in their, at their homes so that they don't, um, uh, don't need to get out of bed at the crack of dawn and, and jump in a cab into central London. So uh, that's one simple example. I'm, I'm interested to hear um, if any of the delegates here um, can add to that. Um, I want to hear some examples from you of how your organisations are applying these uh, principles. Uh, is it... Does anybody have anything, uh, any ideas around alternatives to travel that they, that they think are interesting that they want to share with the room? Yes, please, lady over there in the middle. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Marsh from the Internet ben Benchmarking Forum. Um, we're a small company of about 50 people, um, but... We work very much remotely, and we work through tools. Um, our intranet, we use things like Yammer, microblogging, um, Skype. And there's people in the company I've worked with for years who I've maybe met once or not met at all. And yet the sense of connection that's actually possible through a combination of different tools um, is, is really quite amazing. So I think the possibilities are there. I think moving from you know these kind of traditional cultures where there is not the trust um, placed in employees. And the poem at the beginning kind of humorously, you know, picked up on that in a way, um, is really how do we move beyond, you know, companies that just, just kind of retain that mindset um, about employees. I think that's a big barrier that needs to be overcome. That's, uh, that's quite interesting, actually, um, that you say that using uh, a combination of technologies... Um, uh, gives you a, a richer sense of engagement with with other people because I think uh, we talked about this last night actually one of one of the biggest obstacles really to to using remote technologies is I think um, getting over that barrier of needing to be in a room with somebody um, and and it's very interesting uh, people often look at one specific technology and say well yes that's very good but um, that's not going to um, work in, in it works in one dimension but not in every dimension and so it's interesting to hear you say that you're using a variety of different ones and getting the similar kind of uh, uh, reaction from that. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add to that? Does anybody want to mention any, any useful? Yes sir, you over here, a uh, gentleman on the right. Get the microphone over here. Thank you. Um, Adrian Bell from Johnson Controls. Um, a short while ago, I was working in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is like a, a mini version of the Home Civil Service. And one of the things they've done there is create a common technology infrastructure for all of its 11 departments. And we, we were encouraging staff to just go into their local uh, government office, no matter what department it was. Mm -hmm. So the, the question, I guess, when we look at the bigger scale of the Home Civil Service is how easy is it for somebody to go into their local government office, which may be not their department, and work? Okay, Norman, 
The, the answer is not easy enough, if I'm perfectly frank with you. And we need to do far more of that. It, you know, from, from the point of view of the public, and indeed it should be the point of view of the government, we're one entity. And the resources we have are the buildings we have and the people we have. And really, the fact that one's got DCMS over the door and something else has got a home office over the door, she's neither here nor there, really. Now, of course, there are certain security issues and, 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 and so on. But apart from that, we ought to be far more flexible, it seems to me, in what we do. Um, we've, got, we've got buildings around the country. I said the Department for Transport and Hastings. That should be available not just to the DFT, in my view, but to other departments. Uh, other people have got departments in, in, in the Midlands or in the North. They equally should be available to all government departments. So that one of the aspects we need to look at, I think, is better use of, of departments, breaking down this silo mentality. Actually, there's a benefit to that as well, as you'll appreciate, which is that um, we ought to try to, I think, all of us, it's sometimes difficult, work collectively and cohesively rather than by department when you end up with different departmental positions which then uh, end up running into some other department's position. And it seems to me that uh, there's a psychological benefit as well, therefore, by, by that sort of approach, which breaks some of those barriers down. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on the word psychology. I think this is a matter of just persuading people that this agenda makes sense. And it's, and it's that barrier to overcome. It's not particularly a cost barrier, and it's not particularly a technology barrier. It's, it's, a, it's a psychological barrier that this different way of working makes sense. The idea that people shouldn't come into work may be better than them coming into work. The idea that people shouldn't travel is better than they do travel. And so a lot of this is counterintuitive to people. And it's that we have to, to get around. And, I, and I've found that people do get preconceptions of ideas, which are quite difficult to shift. For example, a museum. Uh, a museum is a terribly negative word. People think of kind of polar bears and glass cabinets, and museums are nothing like that these days. Uh, when you think of manufacturing, this is a big problem in this country. Uh, people think manufacturing is kind of people in blue overalls and, and low-paid jobs and, and, get, and getting very, you know, covered in oil. Nothing like that these days. So we have to change some of these mindsets, and I think this is what this is about. And the fact that we've got um, support from the CBI and uh, from the TUC for, for anywhere, uh, anywhere working, I think is a terribly helpful development. And, uh, and as I say, we have to make sure that it's not an alternative in terms of on the fringe, but it comes central to our way of working. And I think everybody in this, ro in this room has a role to play in, in achieving that. Okay, thank you, Norman. Um, any other questions for Norman? Uh, gentleman here in the middle. Uh, we'll come to you in a minute, so um, first we'll just take this one here. And another question down here at the front, which we're trying to get to as well. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Adrian Rathbone from Terrial Trillium. Hi, Adrian. Um, the point that was made a little bit earlier, I think, is, is critical and very often missed, and that's about trust. And what I think we're finding fundamentally is we can create the best environments in the world, uh, we can create the best infrastructures, but actually the issue is taking people along with you through that change management programme. I think what we're finding very much in the public sector at the moment is a lack of trust, particularly in the middle managers, allowing their staff to enable them to work in different ways, and fundamentally taking people through that change as opposed to either imposing or assuming that people will get on with it. And I think for us that is the key issue that we need to address. Hmm. Well, I, I would say that that's, that's true, um, but there are incentives, it seems to me, for everybody in this, in this agenda. Nobody, it seems to me, loses out. The employer wins because the employer will have, uh, well, for example, requirement for less space in a central London location, which will save money, fewer car parking spaces and so on. So you save money that way if you're a business. But for the employee, uh, the idea of getting some, some work-life balance back, some flexibility, uh, is, is very important. And also, again, for the employer, the idea that you can have a wider pool of people to pull from, from your workforce, uh, because you're not saying you must work 9 to 5 in this particular location in Holborn, but you can, you can do something different. It means you can, you can look at a wider range of people who you want to employ. And that seems to me to be entirely sensible. And um, you know, the idea that, the, the idea that you, you eliminate somebody from uh, a possibility of a job because they happen to want to take their child to school at 9 o'clock in the morning seems to me to be balmy in this day and age. You know, there's somebody there who's terribly skilled, um, let's say there's, there's a woman who's worked her way, worked her way up the company, she takes maternity leave, she's got a child and actually wants to look after it. Do you want to write that woman off and not use her again? Or do you actually say, no, we'll accommodate that and, and, and uh, we'll work around the arrangements you've got, which we understand. And that's a much more advanced way of doing it. So I think that uh, offer from an, employee to an em uh, employer to an employee actually generates goodwill as well as being interested in both parties.
Thanks, Norman. I'd just like to add, yeah, and uh, as a father of two young kids, I take my kids to school in the mornings. I start working a bit later. Um, I love doing it. it. makes me very happy. It makes me a better employee, I think, in the end. So, um, so very, very wise words, I think. Um, so we take a question from the gentleman at the back uh, who's, um, who's been waiting. You're just up at the back on the left. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's Adrian Dixon from AdNexus. Um, sorry, uh, it seems like the Adrians are uh, monopolizing the questions here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> video conferencing has, um, and, and other technologies um, ha have been employed by you know, the larger organizations, uh, both public and private, for, for some time now. Um, it really does seem that the smaller organizations are the ones who are um, you know, are late on the, the take up of, of all of the, the various technologies. So it's great to hear the lady over there with, uh, you know, utilizing um, a, lot, a lot of the uh, remote working potential. Um, in, in, your, uh, in your paper, um, your initiative, um, have you focused at all on the, the smaller organizations because they are, you know, deemed to be the engine of growth going forward um, as well as the larger organizations? Uh, Yes, I mean, I, I agree with that. And, and what's happened so far is that the people at the cutting edge tend to be the, the, some of the very large companies who have got the capacity, if you like, and, and the flexibility to what would have been seen as taking a chance or doing something different, see how it worked out. Um, and that's inevitable, I think, when you start down a, down a road like this. But now, that, now the, um, the worth has been proven, I think, um, there are many more companies who want to take advantage of this sort of direction of travel. But they won't necessarily all want to buy uh, the same level of equipment that, that Microsoft has given itself. Uh, and why should they? So I think part of this will be to identify ways in which businesses can come together, perhaps through um, with help from local economic partnerships that are being set up, perhaps with help from local councils, to say that in this particular town, uh, we're going to provide a facility there which you can, you can effectively hire and you can get all the benefits of the, uh, of, of the advantages and, and, and so on that the other big companies have got. But you don't have to invest heavily in the machinery and, and, and the technology. You can simply go in there and use it on a need-to-use need to basis. And that seems to me to be a sensible way forward. So I would like to think that the, our LEPs and so on are addressing that issue uh, and looking to have some sorts of locational facilities like that around the country. Okay, thanks, Norman. Uh, we've got time for one more question, I think. Can, can we take this one from the lady at the front here who's been waiting? Hello, it's uh, Bridget Hardy from Intergrands Consulting. Um, hello. I, I wanted to just really make a, a, a couple of points. Um, you talked about um, larger businesses taking up um, new ways of working and particularly in the public sector as well. Um, and I, I think to me, the fundamental problem is the mismatch, not so much the culture, but business structure and the new ways of operation, the fluidity and autonomy that people have to be able to take advantage of work anywhere. Actually, I don't think matches very well with the kind of business process and structures that larger organisations have. I think the smaller organisations actually are probably better able to take advantage because they are more immediate and responsive. Um, and on the other hand, I also feel that if technology is very intuitive and easy, then people will actually adopt it anyway and, and don't have to be forced to adopt it. It will actually, if it works very well, um, it, it actually is, is a natural adjunct to one's business work. So I wondered if you could comment on those two aspects of how you see in the public sector changes to business process and structure uh, to actually make this more natural and whether there will be investment in the kinds of very modern technologies to enable this sort of working to be extremely natural and easy. Uh, you said that people will use the technology if it works. Um, I'm not sure that's always the case because I think, as I say, there's a, there's a psychological block to it. And, for example, some employers will still feel uncomfortable with the idea that, that someone's not in the office you know, signing in, clocking in, um, you know, under their supervision and, and therefore ostensibly working at their desk. And they will feel as they're working from home, they're not really working, they're watching TV or something. Now, all the evidence is that people need to work harder when they're at home uh, than they do when they're in the office. So I think that's a, a, a false concern people have. But I think it's that sort of barrier which is a problem rather than the technological barrier of what you can actually do with a piece 
of equipment. And it's that we have to persuade people that actually uh, there are wins both sides, as I mentioned a moment ago, from approaching things in a different way. Um, in terms of large organizations, you know, I think that the good organizations, whatever their size, have the capacity to innovate and change quickly. Indeed, if they don't have the capacity to innovate, they don't last very long, it seems to me, they get fossilized, uh, and uh, then they put themselves in a difficult position. So um, I'm not sure that I necessarily accept that big companies can't change quickly. Uh, what I would say is that when they do decide to change, uh, then they often have the resources and the wherewithal and the oomph to make a difference, a um, significant difference, and then to set an example which others happen to notice. So um, I'm not quite as pessimistic as you are, I think, about the size of the organisation being, being a, an obstacle. Okay, uh, I think we've come to the end of uh, our time for this uh, Q&A. So I'd just like to uh, say thank you very much to Norman for coming in today and talking to us. And uh, Norman, best of luck with the initiative. Okay, thank you, Norman. Thank you.